Hey everyone, it's Kilowatt and I'm here to spend another story hour with y'all. Isn't that exciting? I'm so excited to share these two new stories I found at Saskatoon Public Library. And are you ready now for our first book? Let's see what it is. Oh, this one is called Gravity and the author of it is Jason Chin. Oh, doesn't that look cool? There's the earth and the sun and an astronaut and a whole bunch of things floating around. Okay. <gasps> gravity. Oh, what is gravity? Do we know what gravity is? <gasps> this is going to be exciting. Let's find out together. Gravity makes objects. Oh, what does it do? What does gravity do? <gasps> fall. <gasps> what? Gravity makes things fall. So when I fall down, that's gravity. Huh? To Earth. <gasps> so things fall to Earth. Look at that. It's a miniature of the book we're reading. Isn't that cool? And this kiddo has like a cool cape on and on the cape is like space and alien machines <gasps> and a rocket ship here and the astronauts there. Ooh, let's see what happens next. Without gravity, everything would. Oh, what's happening to everything? Are they moving? <gasps> Which way do you think they're moving? Float away. Ooh. So it's a good thing we have gravity, hey? Because we wouldn't want to float away like this. Look at all of that stuff floating away. Do you see anything that we saw earlier? There's the rocket ship and the astronaut. Oh, good guess. Oh, look, and there's the ball, the beach ball. The moon would drift away from the earth if we didn't have gravity. Hmm. The earth would drift away from the sun if we didn't have gravity. <laughs> Luckily, everything has gravity. Oh, yay! Oh, look again! It's the book that we're reading inside the book. Isn't that cool? And there's the rocket ship and the pail, and the astronaut. They're just coming with us through the journey. Massive things have a lot of gravity. What does massive mean? Massive means big. So this is big. And these are itty bitty bitty. So look at that. We have the rocket ship, and the astronaut, and the banana, and the pail, and the ball, with the sun behind it. And their gravity pulls on smaller things. So we have the sun, which is huge compared to the planet Earth that we live on. And Earth is over here and it's itty bitty. So the gravity is pulling on Earth. The, gra the sun's gravity is pulling on Earth. Isn't that cool? Gravity keeps the Earth near the sun. The moon near the Earth. Cool. So see how we have relationships with each other. The sun and the earth, the earth and the moon. So cool. And makes, uh oh, what does it make? Oh, let's find out. Objects fall. Oh, so all those objects that float away at the beginning, they are falling back down to earth. Look. These are the clouds, and we can see the grass underneath the clouds, and the rocket ship, and the balloon, and the book, and the astronaut, and the pail, and the shovel are all falling. To Earth. Oh, there we are. Everything is back down to Earth because Earth has gravity. Isn't that cool? And we can learn more about gravity right now. So many cool things. So gravity 
is attractive. Gravity is an invisible force that causes objects to attract each other. Every object in the universe has gravity that is continuously pulling on every other object in the universe. When you jump into a pool, the Earth's gravity is what pulls you down towards the water. <gasps> See, and here's an example. Is someone jumping into the pool. And that's so cool. Now we have more mass means more gravity. So gravity changes depending on where you are. So the gravity pulling any two objects together is determined by the mass of both objects. The greater the combined mass, the stronger the gravity. For this reason, the force of gravity between the Earth and the Sun is, the str is stronger than the force of gravity between the Moon and the Earth. So see our relationship here? is stronger, so it has a bigger arrow between the Earth and the Sun. And we have the Moon and the Earth, and it still has a relationship, but it's just not as strong, so it has a smaller arrow. Weaker with distance. Okay, let's see what this means. An object's gravity extends infinitely. That means pretty much forever. But it becomes weaker with distance Near its surface, Earth's gravity is strong enough to keep you on the ground, but millions of fat miles away, its gravity becomes so weak, you wouldn't even notice it. Even though the gravity of all of the stars in this universe is pulling on you, you can't feel it because they are much too far away. So that's cool. So things that are from, from far from Earth, Earth's gravity is weak. Closer to the Earth, Earth's gravity is strong. So because we're living on Earth, it, our relationship with the gravity is stronger than if we are away from the Earth. And that is why we have are able to float when we get to certain altitudes. Mass matters. Mass is the amount of matter or stuff that makes up an object. Mass can be measured by weighing objects. Heavier objects have more mass. Often, larger objects have more mass than smaller objects. But mass is not the same as size. A big box of air has less mass than a small box of bricks because there is more matter in the box of bricks. So here's an example of a little kid holding up a box of big box of air and a huge, strong person holding a little itty bitty box of bricks but the bricks is so much heavier because there's so much more uh, items made into a smaller space. So it's really super heavy. So it's like, if you're to try and carry one book, it's not so heavy, but if you carry a whole bunch of books, it's a lot more heavy. And that's kind of what mass means. It's how heavy something is. The measure of gravity. Weight is the measure of Earth's gravity, pulling on objects. Since mass determines the amount of gravitational pull on objects, objects with more mass weigh more. Take an elephant and a mouse. For example, the elephant has more mass, so the gravitational pull on it is stronger. And since the pull on it is stronger, it weighs more than the mouse. See? And that's how we get our weight differences. So, elephants are way bigger. So they have more mass, so they weigh more because the relationship with Earth's gravity is more. And a mouse, not so much, because the mouse is nice and little and cute, and it's light because it's a smaller object. So its relationship with Earth's gravity is smaller. Gravity keeps it all together. The Earth travels around the sun in a path called an orbit, and gravity keeps the Earth in this path. Imagine you have a ball on a string and you swing it in a circle. The string will keep the ball from flying away. The gravi sun's gravity is like that. String, it keeps the earth from flying away. All of the planets in our solar system orbit the sun and the moon orbits the earth. And the gravity is what keeps the systems together. Isn't that cool? The string keeps all the ball from flying away, singularly to how gravity keeps the 
similarly to how gravity keeps the Earth from flying away from the sun. So that person is swinging that around. Huh, cool. And that's gravity. Oh, look at this. And our person here was able to catch the pitcher of lemonade as it fell back down as we got the gravity back. And this. So this book, if you wanted to have a closer look at it, is at the public library. And there's a lot of other books about gravity and stuff too, with experiments that you could do with an adult or a, or a older sibling maybe, as long as there's some adult supervision there. So make sure to go to your library and check it out, okay? So I think it's time that we do a little bit of an experiment ourselves, don't you? So I want you to go ask a parent, if they're not around first, to grab two cloths that are the same size. If you don't have cloths, if you have paper towel, just grab two pieces of paper towel and then come back here and we will do a little experiment together about gravity, okay? See you in a bit. Hey everyone, did you go get your two pieces of cloth or paper towel, whatever you have handy? If so, great. What I would like you to do with one of them, see first, I'll show you that they're both the same size. See, same size. And I want you to take one of them and I want you to twist it up and tie it together a couple of times. Make it into a little ball like that. Okay. And then we're going to do our experiment. And you're not going to be able to see my face and stuff, but I want you to be able to see um, when they land. Okay, so I'm going to put the camera on the floor here. Oh, so you can see what happens when they land. So first we'll just do the normal one where it drops. Ready? And when I say the normal one, sorry, I mean the one that isn't tied up. And hold it at your waist and drop it. Cool. Now I want you to take the tied up one and drop it as well. So you see, you could hear that they had different sounds to them, but they're the exact same weight, same mass, same size. Okay, now I want you to stand back up with both, one in each hand, and on the count of three, we're going to drop them together, and what do you think is going to happen? Ready? One, two, three. They landed at the exact same time. Did you think that that was going to happen? Did you think that they were going to both land at the same time, or did you think that maybe this one might land first? So. If you thought that they would both land at the exact same time, you were right. And congratulations. That is totally what gravity does, is it has the same force on everything, as long as the mass is the same, so that it will land at the same time. Isn't that so cool? Oh, Sherlock wants to say hi to everyone. Say hi, Sherlock. Yeah. What else should we try? So when we jump, if we jump, if we didn't have gravity and we jumped, we would totally like go off flying in the sky and this outer space. But because we have gravity, it pulls us back down. So let's do that a couple of times and feel how the gravity pulls us down, okay? On the count of three, one, two, Three, and jump, woo, yeah. Are you gonna jump too, Sherlock? One, two, three, and up, jump. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Okay, then I want you to do squats with me. Do a squat. Are you squatting down? So when we go back up and push ourselves up, we're actually moving against gravity. And that exerts more energy. So when we go down into a squat, it's 
kind of easier, isn't it? And that's because gravity helps pull us down. But then when we go to stand, we're fighting against gravity. And that is how we can feel gravity even though we can't see it. So wasn't that fun? And it got us a little bit out of the wiggly energy times. And are we ready for another story time? I think so. So I'll give you a chance to quickly do a quick run around and go put your paper napkins away or cloth napkins away. And then we'll get started with our second story. Okay, I'm so excited. See you in a second. Bye. Hey everyone, are you ready for our second story? It looks like Sherlock is. So let's all sit down and listen to this awesome story about over and under the pond. And it's by Kate Mesner with art by Christopher Silas Neal. Oh, look at all the pretty drawings. Isn't that amazing? So nice. Okay, so. Over the pond we slide, splashing through lily pads, sweeping through reeds. <gasps> Look at that, they're canoeing through the pond. And there's lily pads and reeds, and the sun and clouds. <gasps> Soon we'll be able to do that as spring approaches, a couple months away. The water's a mirror reflecting the sky, sunshine and clouds, then a shadow below, What's down there, I ask? Under the pond, Mom says. Oh, what's under the pond? Looks like a fish, hey? <gasps> Let's go explore it. Under the pond is a whole hidden world of minnows and crayfish, turtles and bullfrogs. We're paddling over them now. Oh, that's so cool. There's a turtle and these are minnows. And, oh, there's a bullfrog, and there's a crayfish down here. Do you see the crayfish? It's <gasps> pretty cool. Over the pond, we skim past tall rushes, whirligig beetles loop and twirl, skaters on a warm summer surface. Under the pond, minnows dart through, waving force of grass while a brook trout lurks ready to lunge. Oh, let's see if we can see all that happening. Look at, here are the beetles on top of the surface. And then here's the grass with the minnows. And what's that? That's the brook trout. You can tell it's a brook trout because of the dots and the patterns on its skin. Over the pond, we lift and dip and pull past a row of painted turtles on a waterlogged tree. One, two, three, they slip off and away. Splash, gurgle, splush under the pond. Doesn't that look fun? Oh, as the snow melts and stuff, we can put on our, our waterproof gear and go out and splash in the ponds ourselves. So much excitement coming up. Over the pond, cattails rustle and shush in the wind. Listen close. Cucklery! Red-winged blackbirds race by. One has grass for her nest. Oh, look at That's the red-winged blackbird. And this is also the red-winged blackbird. And we know that this one is the male because it's the colorful one, and that's the way that works with this bird species. And the spotted nest on this female allows her to camouflage better within the reeds and stuff to protect the nest. And we know that. That's pretty cool. Under the pond, a caddisfly larvae builds a home of her own, a secret shelter of pebbles and sand. Oh, see all the pebbles and sand? And this is the larvae. Over the pond, the shadows of trees lean out from the shore. We coast under a low-hanging branch. A moose looks up with a mouth full of water lilies. We're interrupting his launch. Oh, yum, yum, yum. Have you ever had a chance to see the water lilies before? I've only seen them a handful of times myself. But maybe if you have some adults that you trust, you can go explore 
in the spring and summer and see if you can find some in some of our little watershed areas. Under the pond, beavers dive deep. They pump with powerful tails and rise to the surface with delectable roots from the mud. Oh, look at them above, below. The big flat tail gets them going through the water really fast. So cool, you can see them in our river here. Last summer, I think Sherlock and I found five at once. Isn't that a lot? So cool. Over the pond, the wind gives us a plush, a push, and stirs the light drabble leaves on shore. There on a branch, a new globed finch teeters, teeters, hmm, that's a fun word, finally ready to fly. <gasps> Look at, there it is right there. Isn't that cool? Under the pond, tadpoles are changing. Learning to hop, they're losing their tails and growing legs and growing up. So see, as the frogs, they don't actually start with like four legs and a body and a head. They actually start as little, little tadpole that go swimming along like this. And then they grow legs and start losing the fins on their tails. And then they lose more of that and grow longer legs until they're finally a full frog. Over the pond there are at the shore, tall and silent and still. A great blue heron stares down into the deep. It tenses. Oh, what's gonna happen? Takes one long legged step. Ooh. And what? What do you think it's going to do? Strikes! What does it strike? Oh, it's catching a minnow! It catches a wiggling quicksilver minnow from where it was hiding under the pond. That's some amazing hunting, hey! Over the pond we drift, heads tipped up to the sun, a woodpecker clinging to a teetering pine, digging for ants. Oh, there's your woodpecker. Have you ever had a chance to see a woodpecker? It just takes its long beak and hits, this, hits the trunk back and forth like this. And then it digs out the insects and eats them. Pretty cool. Under the pond, an otter claws for freshwater mussels. Oh, so see here, these are the mussels. Sometimes you can see their shells on the shoreline. Over the pond, a sleepy dragonfly lands for a rest. His spindly legs tickle my knee. <laughs> that really does tickle. I have had a dragonfly that landed on me before and yeah, it's, it's ticklish, that's for sure. Under the pond, dragonfly larvae watch what swims by. They watch minnows in monster fast jaws. Oh, look at that. So can, they're so small that the minnows seem really big to them. But the minnows seem small to us. Isn't that interesting? Oh, look it, we got raccoons. I love raccoons, they're so cute. Over the pond, the shadows stretch. Osprey circle on quiet wings. Oh, there they are. Raccoons and minks stalk the shoreline for supper. Go hunting. Under the pond, with a flip of a tail, a crayfish disappears in the darkness. Where do you think the crayfish is? <gasps> Can you see it? It's right there. Over the pond, we head for home. We glide, swish, bump, right up onto a shore as a far off loon calls goodnight. The sky turns from sunset to dusk to dark. Night settles over the pond, the prowling catfish and drowsy turtles, the scuttling crayfish and the tadpoles turn frogs, wading herons and stalking raccoons. Oh, look at, there's the loon. There's the frog. What else can we find? Oh, 
think those are the mosquitoes and there's a dragonfly. So cool, eh? And there's the canoe back at the dock and at the cabin. And the hidden world under the pond. Don't you love how water reflects the skies at times? This picture represents that so nicely. And that's it. So this book still has lots more in it and talks about the different animals and insects and reptiles that it grew, oh, talked about in the, the book. And it also recommends further readings so you can go and learn more about it. So let's, if you have time, I'm going to go through these information things about the animals. But if you don't have time, that's okay. You can borrow this book from the library and read it yourself or with an adult or an older, older sibling or cousin or a friend who knows how to read. So let's start with some of these cool books, okay? Whirly gig beetles are so well known for speeding in wild circles over the water. The Kaufman Field Guide to Insects of North America by Eric R. Eden and Ken Kaufman calls them the bumper cars of the beetle world. Whirly gig beetles swim by rowing with their middle and hind legs. Their eyes are split so that half is above the water line and half is below. So these beetles can see well both over and under the pond. And that's them. Brook trout, also known as speckled trout, live in ponds, streams, creeks, and small rivers and lakes. They eat not only dragonfly larvae, but also a variety of other insects, other fish, crayfish, frogs, and even small aquatic mammals such as pebbles. Brook trout are both predator and prey in a pond ecosystem. They're hunted by larger fish, mink, otters, raccoons, and the birds such as the kingfisher and great blue heron. So do you remember seeing that fish in the book earlier? Yeah. Painted turtles, named for the bright red and yellow markings on their bodies, usually on their legs and the outer parts of their shell. Love to bask in the sun on logs. They eat insects, crayfish, mollusks, and aquatic plants. In the wintertime, painted turtles burrow into the mud at the bottom of the pond to hibernate, just like bears. Except that bears go into dens, not into mud. Red-winged blackbirds often build their nests near ponds and other wetlands, and you'll see them perched on cattails. The males calling cucklery, cucklery, only the males have red wings. Females are brown and look more like sparrows. A red-winged blackbird's diet depends on the season. They eat lots of insects in the summer and feed mostly on seeds in the winter. Catfish larvae are architects of the insect world. As the larvae develop, they use silk glands near their mouths to make nets for catching bits of plant matter for food and to build cases for themselves, which they piece together using sand, tiny pebbles, and plant materials. These cases help to camouflage the larvae and protect them from predators, but many larvae still end up being a meal for fish or birds. The caddisfly larvae that survive develop into adult caddisflies, which look like small moths, live near water, and are attracted to the lakes at night. So, isn't that cool? The moose, we have a lot of those around here, are herbivores, which means they eat only plants. Aquatic vegetation, such as water lilies, are among their favorite summertime meals. Moose are the largest members of the deer family. They can be six feet tall. Whoa! And the male's antlers can grow up to six feet wide. Isn't that huge? That's taller than me. You wouldn't think such a huge animal would feel at home in the water, but moose are good swimmers and have been known to swim several miles at a time. Isn't that cool? There you go. The head of the moose. Beavers. 
form the building crews of the wetland world. When they can't find a suitable home in a river, lake, or pond, they'll make one. Beavers use their powerful jaws to take down trees. They block streams with tree trunks, branches, and mud to create the ponds they love. Beavers also use sticks and mud to build their lodges, homes with secret underwater entrances. Oh, isn't that cool? It's like they make their own bat caves. It's awesome, kind of like Batman, right? Batman and secret cave, yeah. All right. I'm a geek and a nerd. It's great. The American goldfinch nests in shrubs and saplings and breeds later than many other birds. Finches wait until June or July to build their nests to that, so that seeds from plants like milkweed and the thistle are available to feed their young. And that's that goldfinch again. Tadpoles and bullfrogs are common in ponds. Even when it's hiding, it's hard to miss the male bullfrog's loud growling croak. Female bullf bullfrogs can lay up to 20,000 eggs. That's a lot of eggs. Many of those eggs don't survive, but those that do hatch into tadpoles, which then take up to three years to lose their gills and tails and fatten up and grow legs to become a frog. You can tell a male bullfrog from a female by looking at the tympanum or eardrum near the eye. In males, it's much bigger than the frog's eye, while in females, it's about the same size or smaller. So that's the tadpole, how they start out, and that's what the full-size frog looks like. When a great blue heron is hunting, it waits slowly or stands still, as still can be, eyes on the water. Then in a flash, it thrusts its head into the water and uses its bill to stab a fish or a frog. Great blue herons have special photoreceptors in their eyes that help them to see better in the dark so they can hunt day or night. So remember the one that went hunting in the book? That's it again. Piloted woodpeckers hammer away at trees in the forest, searching for insects. Carpenter ants are their primary food source. The woodpeckers dig long, deep, rectangular holes in dead or dying trees right into the ants' tunnels. These birds have powerful beaks and long barbed tongues for pulling out beetle larvae and termites from the wood. Isn't that cool? River otters live in burrows on the shores of lakes, ponds, rivers, and marshes and come into the water to hunt for fish. Freshwater mussels, which they crack open on rocks, crayfish, frogs, and turtles. They're excellent swimmers with powerful tails, webbed feet and ears and nostrils that close in the water. River otters can hold their breath underwater for up to eight minutes. Wow. How long can you hold your breath when you're swimming? I don't, can't hold mine very long. I think I'm like 15 seconds. I should work on that. Dragonflies love ponds and other wetlands because there are so many insects to eat. Dragonflies have four wings that can move independently allowing this insect not only to fly, but also to hover like a helicopter over the pond. Cool, eh? The blue dasher dragonfly, also known as the blue pirate, catches bugs in the air and may devour hundreds in a single day. Dragonfly larvae are just as fierce while they're developing underwater. They eat mostly aquatic insects and other larvae, but have been even been known to catch small tadpoles and tiny fish in their powerful jaws. Isn't that cool? Osprey are master anglers that fly over the lakes, ponds, and rivers, watching for prey. When they spot a fish, they dive feet first, clutch the unlucky fish in their talons, and carry it back to their perch or nest to eat or to feed their young. Some ospreys are seasoned travelers as well. Some may travel more than 100,000 miles, migrating over a lifetime. Raccoons are omnivores, which means they eat both plants and animals. They'll gobble fruits and greens and raid nests for eggs and hunt for crayfish and frogs. Raccoons have super fast paws and fingers that are good for grabbing their prey. In northern climates, they eat a lot in the warmer months because they sleep a lot during the winter, using up the stored fat. Mink live in burrows in the banks of ponds, rivers, and lakes. They're champions swimmers that can dive up to 16 feet. 
deep in a search of prey. Mink eat a wide variety of pond creatures, including crayfish, frogs, fish, and small mammals. They don't have many natural predators other than bobcats and coyotes. Their biggest threat is humans who trap them for their fur. So there's the raccoon face and the mink outline. Should be no surprise that freshwater crayfish and lobsters are related. Ooh, crayfish look like miniature models of their saltwater cousins, complete with claws that can pack quite a pinch. Like that. Crayfish eat aquatic plants, worms, and bits of decaying matter in the water. When they're threatened, they rear up their claws held high, then flick their tails to propel themselves backwards to take cover under a log or rock. See, that's kind of what they look like. It's the illustrator's version of it. Catfish. Oh, there's a, there's a fish. Our name for the barbels around their mouths, which resembles a cat's whiskers. whiskers. Most catfish are bottom feeders that prowl the bottoms of ponds and lakes and use their feelers to search out food and find their way in the dark, deep water. The bullhead, one kind of catfish that lives in North America, has a varied diet that includes insects, dead or alive. Other fish, crayfish, and fruits or grains that drop into the water. Isn't that cool? And like I mentioned before, there's further reading recommendations in this book uh, with books and websites that you can go and explore. So I'll hold that up there so that if you wanted, you can pause the video and write down some of those ones. Or you can go to the library and borrow the book and further explore them or get recommendations from the people who work at the library because I'm sure they have ones that they would like to recommend as well. Well, that's it for story time with me today. Thank you so much for spending some more time with me and Sherlock. Oh, hey Sherlock. Come on up. Come say hi. Come on up. Say hi. Sherlock says hi and wants to give hugs to you all. Yes, hugs. And we hope you have a fantastic day as the days get longer and the nights get shorter. As the snow starts to melt. We're going to be able to start seeing and exploring so many cool things outside, such as different insects and the birds coming back and the leaves and the trees coming back. So make sure to keep an eye out for those and watch it as the seasons change from winter to spring. Okay, see you next time. Bye.